So to my mind, the best conception of philosophy is that um, offered by Deleuze and Guattari in What is Philosophy, where they essentially say philosophy is the creation of concepts. Um, and that's kind of a sort of a well-known, famous Deleuzean line. Um, a little less well-known is that they went on to say that philosophy is the creation of concepts in response to problems or problematics or what Foucault had called just a few years before them problematizations or what Dewey decades before all of them had called a problematic situation or what James and Peirce before Dewey called doubt. Right? So philosophy on this picture is creation of concepts in response to these problematic moments of hesitation or doubt or anxiety um, that we find ourselves meeting with and that we find ourselves sometimes seeking out and curiously exploring and intensifying and um, working through. So the, the internet is one example of something that I think um, is kind of a, an, an emblem for a curveball in contemporary culture that previous philosophers of culture couldn't have really anticipated. By that I mean the internet as an emblem for this whole motley mangle of practices and politics and ethics and problems of information that we find ourselves awash in today. There's a whole series of books to be written about new forms of subjectivation that are emerging in the present vis-a-vis um, -vis or in the context of all these wild new mangles called social media, right? Um, how does somebody form themselves as a subject through Twitter or through a Facebook profile? Or how does somebody form themselves as a subject, um, you know, a teenager in high school knowing that Facebook, even if they don't have an account, is a sort of constant presence on campus, right? Um, I mean, these are, yeah, these are fascinating, but to me they're philosophical questions because they go to the heart of how we think about ourselves, they go to the heart of, of what will come to be some of the core ethical questions of the 21st century, I would suspect, um, and they really demand the kind of careful philosophical attention that Foucault and Dewey and other figures from the history of philosophy gave to <clears throat> different moments of the formation of the subject. Now, if you take somebody like Dewey or Foucault, you can say, well, how much, how much of our contemporary informational selves did they get? How much of contemporary informational persons did they anticipate or did they um, discern the contours of? Um, when they were writing. Um, and again, the answer is not, it's not all of it. They didn't get all of us, right? Um, but certainly there are, are threads that, of, of the history of who we are that they picked up on and made visible um, that are part of the history of who we are. So Dewey writing about communicative publics in 1927, the public and his problems, um, the importance of communication for mass democratic society and organizing publics around communicative capacity and facility. Um, that's certainly not um, unimportant for contemporary politics of information. And Foucault's histories of the formation of the subject in 19th century and 20th century regimes of discipline, where a key, you know, a key idea for Foucault was surveillance, right? And that's something we're hearing a lot about again today is surveillance. Um, so, you know, a lot of uh, commentators, um, both academic and non-academic, you know, thinking back to, oh, right, Foucault wrote about this thing called the Panopticon, and well, this, all the, the new stuff with the new data valence, that's panopticism, that's data panopticism or something. Um, and yeah, right, Foucault, you know, he gets some of it. The history of how we came to a place where the collection of information about ourselves is this sort of unnerving thing that it, that it has come to be, surely includes um, the history of panopticism that Foucault wrote. But the panopticism isn't the whole story, and in fact there are really important differences. Like it's crucial to panopticism that the panoptic subject, classically the prisoner in the cell, doesn't know if they're being surveilled, right? They, it's surreptitious, right? It's, it's not something that, that, that is available to them. Um, but 
the fact that they are being surveilled, that's overt. That There's a guard tower there. Now, I don't know if there's a guard in it, but there's a tower, and I could be being observed. Um, so the sort of the overtness of it, right, the, the sense in which it's available to the panoptic subject to know that it's under, under the optic of, the, of, of surveillance, that's not really what you have going on with contemporary surveillance, data valence programs, which were at least designed, now that's changed, were designed to be surreptitious through and through, right? It wasn't that um, certain government programs, at least in the US and much of Europe, were putting everybody under data valence and claiming, well, we might be sniffing your packets or we might not be, but we could be, right? Um, Rather, they did that, but they didn't want us to know, right? Um, and again, it's not, you know, I don't think it's some sort of conspiracy. They're bad guys. They're trying to get us all. Um, they're trying to do something that they think is good. I don't know if I agree if it's good or not, but, it's, you know, their, their intentions aren't this sort of conspiratorial thing. Um, but it was meant to be um, surreptitious through and through. So, you know, is that... A huge difference? Is that an important difference? Probably it is an important difference if we think about how we're going to work to undo this, this sort of thing, or how we're going to work to redo it, um, given that maybe we don't want to undo it, or maybe we do, but it's undoable at this point. Um, but how are we going to reconfigure? How are we going to reperform in a kind of Judith Butler sense, our contemporary informational selves? How am I going to make myself a different kind of data subject? Well, it helps to know what sort of optic I'm under and not just assume that, well, Foucault got it right because he had this massively interesting insight that kind of blew me away when I first read about it in college. And that's, you know, that's so right, and therefore it's right about everything. No, I mean, it, it is so right, but it's not right about everything because Foucault didn't write about the internet because there really was no such thing as the internet as we know it until, you know, it depends how you count, but certainly not the kind of cultural takeoff that you know, until the mid-90s, so... So the history of philosophy, it's a valuable set of resources in terms of how we mobilize historicism and constructivism in the present, um, but we can't just rely on it, right? We can't let the historicist project come into contact with the history of philosophy by way of sort of the history of philosophy overwhelming it and saying, well, we got it all right in the history. Um, there needs to be a kind of back and forth, a give and take, a, um, an interdigitation, as I like to talk about it, and which I can nicely demonstrate with my fingers right now. Interdigitating. 